Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, I'm Gary Bowen, Dean of the School of Social Work, and it gives me great privilege today to introduce Gene Nichol, who is the board, uh, Boyd Tinsley Distinguished Professor at Law here on this campus. Um, from actually 2005 to 2008, uh, Gene was president of the College of William and Mary. Uh, formerly, he was a Burton Craig professor and dean of the law school here uh, from 1999 to 2005. So being the new dean, Gene, I may need to seek your consultation about how to do this job better. Um, <laughs> he attended the Oklahoma State University, receiving a degree in philosophy in 1973 and played varsity football. And if you stood by uh, Gene, you understand that he must have played on the offensive line, I assume. Uh, and he attained his JD from the University of Texas in 1976, the same year that I received my MSW from this campus. He is the author of Seeing the Invisible, uh, Putting a Face on Poverty in North Carolina, which was published in 2014. And he is a recipient of numerous awards, uh, including, including he was inducted into the Order of the Long Leaf Pine of North Carolina's highest civilian honor. He was also given by this university as Thomas Jefferson Award, uh, and that is indeed the highest bounty honor that one can receive. He is the former director of the UNC Center on Poverty, Work, and Opportunity, which was founded in 2005. Uh, that uh, center was closed by our legislature on uh, 2030, uh, 2015. Um, there's a story in that that I, maybe Gene will share. Maybe he'll not uh, share. Uh, since that time, he's launched, and this is more important, since that time, he's launched the NC Poverty Research Fund, and his purpose is to carry forward uh, the earlier efforts from the Center on Poverty Work and Opportunity to explore, document, and research and publish the immense challenges of economic hardship in North Carolina. Join me in welcoming Gene Nichol. Thank you, Gary. I uh, have been a new dean a couple times, and it's exciting and challenging, and I'm glad you're doing it, not me. Uh, but this is a great place to lead. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. Uh, it is true, uh, as the dean said, that I um, Played football in college. Uh, I was also a philosophy major, uh, which meant that at Oklahoma State University, I had two very distinct sets of friends. Uh, one was, uh, one group was mostly from India. Uh, they weighed on average about 85 pounds. They spoke with heavy accents and we spent all our time talking about Ahimsa and Hinduism and Gandhi. And the other group weighed on average about 320 pounds, and as far as I could tell, spoke no ascertainable language whatsoever. Uh, so I got used to divergent groups early on. I uh, I'm very, I, I'm honored to be here. And I mean that, you know, there are lots of ways speakers can say that. I don't mean it just in the etiquette sense. Uh, I am honored to be with you because of the work that you undertake and the work that you pledge to undertake. Uh, you choose to live out the way I think of it, Vaclav Havel's definition of hope which he described not as a description of the world around us or a prediction of success. God knows you wouldn't want to have to live with such predictions. But as a predisposition of the spirit, a sort of habit of the heart, the choice to live in the belief that we can make a difference in the quality of our shared and sometimes threatened lives. An option. You opt. It is the nobler of contested hypotheses when you think about it. Uh, and I'm honored to be in the same room with you. I was 
Thinking about this too, we lost uh, President Bill Friday a couple years ago, who uh, one of the great fortunes of my life is we had become close friends. Uh, when I was Dean of the Law School, I would ask President Friday to come over and speak to the entering students, uh, which he always gladly did. And every time he would include this line, there are a million North Carolinians living in poverty who are subsidizing your education. You're going to want to think about what you're going to do to pay them back. Stuck with every one of them. One of the reasons I like coming here is unlike some other parts of the campus probably, you don't have to worry about that answer. You've got the ready response to the life that you have chosen to undertake. Uh, I was just a few weeks ago over at the School of Public Health uh, here, just a couple buildings over. Great, great folks doing the work of the Commonwealth as well, like you will. I uh, was talking not long ago to the Bonner scholars over in the why program, the campus wipe. So part of what I, I'm trying to get across, even when we seem confused and like we're losing our way in this great university, we're not. And there is powerful accomplishment and challenge and greatness and great heart all across this campus. A lot of it's right here. And I'm honored to be with you. Now, as I start, this is odd, I know, but, uh, I'm asked to say that I do not speak for the University of North Carolina. Uh, that hardly seems necessary to me, except for a few outliers like yourselves. I'm barely allowed to speak at the University of North Carolina, much less <laughs> for the University of North Carolina. But uh, the university I love takes great solace when I give it the opportunity to distance itself from me. So uh, I do that now. I was thinking about this though, this business of who speaks for whom. Uh, I was wondering if uh, Congressman Robert Pittenger speaks for us here in North Carolina when he says that the demonstrators in Charlotte are out there because they hate white people and they hate white people because white people are successful and they are not. He's elected to Congress. He's speaking for us. Uh, I don't know. Um, would Governor McCrory speak for us when he says that HB2 takes away no one's rights? All facts to the contrary. So this speaking for business is complex. And, uh, I mean, you know, I'm going to do my best not to be annoying to anybody, so I'll push right past it, but I just was thinking about this. I'm going to talk about North Carolina's largest challenge, the notion of intense poverty amidst plenty. It is a tough subject. It is not pleasant. It is important, crucial. And as you all know, largely ignored. So I'm glad to talk about it, even if uh, it runs the risk of annoying someone. Uh, I was thinking about this when I was introduced by the dean. If you, if you would follow that cascade for most all of the, well, the great bulk of the last 25 years, I've been either a university president or, or much longer a law school dean in a couple of places. And, uh, I was surprised during those long tenures how often deans and particularly presidents are called upon not to talk about important matters like I'm going to try to do today, but to give what I came to think of as warm and mindless remarks. Uh, here's Bill Wichert. He knows of these things. That is, you know, you, you've been around universities uh, where you uh, give these brief, warm, affectionate, ditties to various friends and alumni of the campus designed to convince them that uh, 
everything is going swimmingly at their home institution, uh, regardless of what they might read in the newspapers. Uh, never to say anything strident or important or challenging or crucial or worth listening to. I was surprised, to be honest, how big a part of the job of being a university president, the giving of warm and mindless remarks was. I was even more surprised when my colleagues started to say, I am with unanimity, that I was really quite gifted at giving warm and mindless remarks, that I'm a natural for it. So this is notice. I'm going to depart from my best skills and my usual habits and talk about something that matters here. But if in about 10 minutes I forget myself and start asking you for money, please forgive me. Old habits <laughs> die hard. You know in broad strokes of North Carolina's poverty challenges, 17% of us live below the stingy federal poverty standard, which is about $24,000 a year for a family of four, under living on that. 1.6 million of us, of our roughly 10 million folk, live in poverty. About 24% of our children, 40% of our children of color, let that sink in for just a minute, in one of the most economically vibrant states of the richest nation on earth, four out of 10 of our babies, middle schoolers, teenagers of color live in wrenching poverty. A simple declarative fact, which shames us as a people. These are poverty figures that are far higher, just for perspective, than in other advanced industrialized nations, much higher levels of child poverty than in other nations. Poorer standards of economic mobility mark us now. If you are born poor in the United States, you are more apt to stay that way than in other advanced nations. And we gather here at noon in the South, the native home of American poverty, where we have more poor people and more politicians who are utterly untroubled by it than the rest of the country. 10 of the United States' poorest 12 states are Southern, though about 14% of Americans live in poverty generally, and Mississippi, it's 22%, Louisiana, 22%, Arkansas, 20 Georgia, 19 Texas, 19 South Carolina, 19 We share the indignity of poverty here in the South with our kids. In fact, we visited on them disproportionately. Of the 10 states with child poverty rates over 25%, nine are from the South. Of the 11 states with over 10% of their kids living in extreme poverty, and that would be an income of $12,000 a year for a family of four. Of those 11, 10 are Southern. The Southern Education Foundation reports that of the 6 million children in the United States living in extreme poverty, a disproportionate 43% are from the American South. The former Confederate states set the gold standard in American economic deprivation. And that same story could be told in the South about access to health care, about income mobility. We lead the nation in the parade of horribles. Still, oddly, we are the states most strongly opposed to stimulus efforts or health care reform or the expansion of Medicaid, we would benefit by far the most from such programs, but uh, we are the most opposed to them. Maybe it's not the right ones of us that would benefit, I'm not sure. This is a mouthful, I know, and you're already starting to get that depressed look on your face and jaws kind of dropping, and sort of bumming you out. I don't mean to do that. I didn't want to start with hard blows right at the front. I don't want you to think it's all bad news. There is a different cast we could look at this way. I read 
a report in the New York Times now some months back. And to be honest, this is now, this data is a couple years old. I'm going to use it just for illustration, closer to the throes of the recession. But when I looked, and I've been too depressed to go back and update it, it said that Gucci high-end sales had risen 24% on the year and for several years running. Yves Saint Laurent was close behind at 23. Mercedes Benz profits had risen by over 30%. BMW had more than doubled its quarterly profits in sales of its S Class sedan that apparently cost over $200,000 in an automobile. Saks Fifth Avenue's full year net income rose by 57%. Sadly, and almost tragically, Neiman Marcus had sold out nationwide of something called Christian Lobatien Bianca platform pumps at 1,200 bucks a pair. Now you're laughing and I may have pronounced that wrong, I know. I asked my wife, and thank Jesus she didn't know how to pronounce it either. So, <laughs> But this report indicated at the same time that Walmart had begun selling smaller packages because its shoppers didn't have enough cash on hand to buy these big multi-packs of toilet paper. Contrast. North Carolina has one of the nation's fastest rising poverty rates. Ten years ago, we were 26th. When you think about it, that's just a tiny bit better than average. Now we are 12th, having sped past the competition. About 600,000 of our children are officially poor. School districts statewide, and it's a little different definition, but they report 28,000 North Carolina school children are homeless. 700,000 Tar Heels live in extreme poverty, again, uh, on incomes of uh, less than $12,000 a year for a family of four. Two millions of us, so it's 20%, are classified by the federal government as hungry. It's the nation's fourth highest rate. Nearly 630,000 of our children last year didn't get enough to eat. Greensboro in 2014, for the second year running, was named the United States' hungriest city, number one. The new report out, it has slipped to third, so we can celebrate that. 2011 study deemed Winston-Salem the worst city in America for food hardship for kids five and under. National report last year said Roanoke Rapids and Lumberton were two of the three poorest cities in the United States. Robson County had America's third highest food stamp participation rate of all the counties in the United States. And as my old man would say, that's a boatload of counties. But my old man never said boatload in his life. You can be sure of that. Professor Chetty's noted Stanford and Harvard mobility studies, as you likely know, concluded two years ago that Charlotte has the worst economic mobility of any city in the United States, 50th out of 50 of our major cities. So that if you're born poor in Charlotte, you're more apt to stay that way than anywhere else in the country. I guess Harvard's recommendation if you're born poor in Charlotte is to move as quick as you can. Last year, the Census Bureau announced that North Carolina had, in the last decade, experienced greater rise in concentrated poverty. Charlotte has certainly seen this. We have been working in Charlotte the last few months. Greater rise in concentrated poverty than any other state. Business Insider peeled the data back to reveal that four of the 10 American cities with the sharpest increases in concentrated or ours, Winston-Salem was ninth, Greensboro sixth, 
Charlotte fourth, Raleigh third. We are the Super Bowl champs of exploding, usually racialized, concentrated poverty. But stunning as those numbers are, uh, without going into it too much, we're in the middle of a very potent electoral campaign, state, statewide, federal. I never hear these issues mentioned whatsoever by either party. Uh, it seemed to me if you had the hungry city in America, that might focus your attention at least. I can understand that Republicans and Democrats would have different theories for dealing with having the most hungry babies, but the notion that we just wouldn't talk about it, wouldn't think about it, wouldn't consider it worthy of public discourse is uh, astonishing. Now, uh, maybe I should say it's, it is not true that nothing has been done on that front, given those hunger statistics that I pointed out to you. Two years ago, our legislature did cut the state's appropriation to food banks in half. And last year, they kicked over 100,000 people off food stamps. So it's not as if they're not exploring the question. But despite everything I've just said, and all these numbers, I'm not really here to talk to you about numbers. They're kind of dry and deadly, I know. I can tell by the look on your face. And, you know, figures on a ledger sheet, easily brushed aside and ignored. I wanna talk some about the flesh and blood behind the numbers. Tar Heel flesh and blood. Just talking about the data, it's not quite the same thing, for example, as staying out all night long with 1,100 Tar Heels waiting for over 36 hours throughout the night outside the Fayetteville Civic Center, hoping to receive free dental care when at 8.30 the next morning, eventually at the Civic Center, this remarkable, sort of astonishing medical mission would open up. Folks who had traveled often from great distances, usually to have teeth extracted because that's the simple kind of procedure that uh, you can do in this sort of one-stop shop. When asked repeatedly when they'd last seen a dentist, as my students and I did, they would say 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. Sure, it hurts, it hurts like hell but who can afford to see a dentist? Story after story of people saying, my tooth has been killing me. I went to the dentist. Uh, he said it was gonna cost $1,800 to remove it. So I got up and walked out of the office. My favorite story, frankly, was from a old guy who was second in line. Now that's impressive. He'd been waiting over 40 hours. I asked him why he was there. He said his wife made him. His wife was with him. <clears throat> uh, his wife said, hell yes, I made him. The last time this happened, he's had a tooth that's been killing him for four months. The last time this happened, he complained and complained and complained about it. Then one day I came home, he was sitting on the couch, a pair of needle node pliers in his hand, dipped the Jack Daniels on the coffee table, and blood all down the front of his shirt. I'm not going through that shit again, she said. Still hundreds. That day had to be turned away. And although two years ago, through heroic efforts, we could have 11 such free clinics across North Carolina. Last year it was four. And the data is it's not the same as meeting with some of the 150 or so wounded souls unable to be accommodated by the marvelous local Salvation Army shelter in Hickory living in the otherwise bucolic woods that surround the city or go through the middle of it, living in makeshift lean-tos and cardboard shanties and ragged tents, at least until the police push them along, shredding their tents as deterrent, also their only possessions, all only a few hundred yards from uh, crawling houses and churchyards, 
in a scene that Dickens would have neither the imagination or the gall to invent? A young woman explaining through her tears, I know I've got to get used to this. I'm sorry for the blubbering, but I've never even been camping before. Or the 47-year-old woman living alone in the woods who explained unemotionally, without tears, without expectation, when you've lost your job and you've lost your savings and you lost your home and you lost your car and then I even lost my cat. I know that sounds funny and stupid, but my cat was very dear to me. When you lose everything, you lose your sense of being a person. You lose your own independent identity. In the phrase that I couldn't get out of my mind, you lose your space to fill in the world. It gets hard to remember that you're still a human being or that you have a decent chance at a decent life or that you deserve one. And the dad is not like talking with Clyde Fitzgerald as we went out to be with again just a couple weeks ago, the retired Reynolds executive who runs the Second Harvest Food Bank of Northwest North Carolina. He's got his work cut out for him. He says hunger, of course, is our greatest challenge. In Forsyth County, 29,000 kids go to school just to get something to eat, not to study, he says. In Guilford County, it's 40,000. The most depressing thing I deal with, Clyde would say if he were here, is talking with the parent who describes a decision he had to make the day before about which one of his kids would eat and which one wouldn't. Or as we saw when talking to a school kid who says, I know I'm misbehaving, I'm sorry, I'm cranky today, but I, it's not my day to eat. It's Gerald's organization, remarkable organization, distributed 30 million pounds of food last year in 18 central and western counties of North Carolina. If we looked at the uh, East and Central Food Bank over in Raleigh, uh, it would be twice that amount. Uh, that 30 million pounds was up from 7 million just five years ago. Think of what an increase that is. But Clyde would say this as well. I could put all 30 million in Greensboro alone, and it wouldn't meet the need even there. And the data is not like talking with some of the 250 or 300 or so folks lined up every morning at 5 a.m. outside Crisis Assistance Ministry in Charlotte, just at the edge of uptown in the shadows of the great banking towers, bailed out banking towers. Folks hoping against hope that when Crisis Assistance opens up at 8, they'll be able to help them to keep them from getting evicted or their power shut off. People who said over and over and over again that they're grateful for the help because they're terrified, not that they'll be homeless, but that their kids will be homeless. And they're grateful for food stamps that keep their kids from starving. But what they really wish is that they could be paid a fair wage. We all worked many long hours, sometimes more than one job. They say, look, I work more than 40 hours a week. I make $8 an hour. I hadn't had a raise in five years. The folks I work for know that you can't pay rent and electricity and transportation and childcare in Charlotte, North Carolina on $8 an hour. They know I'm a good employee. I do right by them. And yet they pay me wages, which lead me right at the edge of starvation. Why is that okay? Just cause you can do it. Just cause you can get away with it. Why is it thought Christian, they would say. I see these same folks going down to these nice churches. Why is that all right? Or in Goldsboro, where a marvelous and inspiring kindergarten teacher who had been married for over 15 years to an army man, doing well, running her own daycare center. But he left her and their kids, and now she works extremely long hours and lives in the housing authority, which is all she has money for. He says all the affordable housing in Goldsboro was terrible and dangerous. When her husband left, our kids didn't understand why they couldn't go to McDonald's or anywhere like that anymore. Those days were over. At West Harris, where she lives, there are gunshots 
all the time, day and night, ambulances and police out there all the time. They were out there at 10 o'clock this morning, she said, the last time we met. She wishes there was a backyard where her children could play safely, but that's not possible. One of the great things about the new school she found is that the school bus pulls right up to the front door. The regular public school only stops at the bus stop three blocks from her house, and that is simply too dangerous for her kids to use. My day starts at six in the morning, she said, at school, where I teach the babies, as I have since 2004. And now it's safe for my kids, because they only have to go to the driveway to come an hour and a half later. Or Miss Shauna Fox, who has three kids, ranging from four to 17, living, as a lot of folks describe it in Goldsboro, in the projects. Housing is very limited, she reports. She works long hours at minimum wage jobs, but the kids miss their mama, and our housing area is very dangerous, and we don't have playgrounds or parks. A seven-month-old boy was shot some times ago. Her boyfriend and her son saw the shooting, so my kids can't go outside. Cops don't come in here unless they get three or four in a group. And we're also the only white people here, so our kids get targeted some, both here and at school. Transportation's a problem. There's a school bus, but it only goes up to South Slocum Street, and that's too dangerous for my kids to walk to. Ms. Fox had a good job with a big solar farm in nearby Pikeville for many years, but it shut down. Couldn't find a comparable job. She lost her house, and her kids lived with her and the dog in a camper for two and a half years. Now the place where we live is dangerous and insect infected. My smallest one gets a lot of bites. We also have to sleep on air mattresses. It's especially hard for the kids because they've had better before. And they know I'm scared. My fear rubs off on them. There are gunshots, I yell at them all the time to get down. Not that long ago, I had a good job and a house, and now I feel hopeless, and I wake up dreading every single day. Or more briefly, it's not like speaking with <clears throat> candid healthcare workers in Rocky Mount who explain to us without embarrassment that they bend the rules to place oxygen in the homes of their impoverished and incapacitated patients in order to make it tougher, as it does under state law, for the power company to shut off uh, electricity and water, uh, which sometimes they can't afford. Or meeting with the 70-year-old black woman from Winton who drives the school bus morning and afternoon, every day, twice a day, making me worry for the traffic patterns in Winton, however large they are. She does that to get the resources she needs for medicine and therapy for her disabled husband. You know her, we talk a lot about her down on Jones Street. She is one of North Carolina's lazy poor. With a brilliant young black mother from Halifax County who graduated from here four years ago now, lost her job, she went back home in a closing, eventually lost her housing and her sense of hope, but she explained to us that she feared she was losing the much more important battle with her young son against peer pressure about the importance of going to school at all. Because as he said to her, Mama, how could you prove that by what's happened to you? With a daughter in Wilson who frets for her 62-year-old father with heart disease who can't get in to see a doctor unless he can come up with the $400 that he owes and he has no prospects for. So she fears every day the call. And we couldn't figure out, Reverend Barbara and I, who carried the greater burden, the daughter or the father? And of course, if he lived in any of the 31 states that have expanded Medicaid, or if he lived in any of the 34 OECD countries, he wouldn't have to worry about it. He could have health care effectively as a right. But because he lives in the United States, and particularly because he lives in North Carolina, he might die. When we ask our leaders for an explanation, why are 500,000 Tar Heels put in this position when the federal government pays almost the entirety of the tab? 
They don't offer a reason why. And of course, all this happens in a state and in a country where huge numbers of us and most of our leaders claim that we have so much poverty because we are too generous with welfare benefits. The United States treats its poor more harshly than any other advanced nation. So if being tough on poor people reduced poverty, we would have the fewest instead of the most. The frank truth is, if the exclusions and indignities of American race and poverty are right, then our Constitution is wrong. If these kind of debilitations of those locked at the bottom are okay and unproblematic, then our scriptures are wrong. And if these denials of equal citizenship and humanity and dignity are permissible, then we pledge allegiance to a cynical illusion, not to a foundational creed. And I think we know it. It's like Lyndon Johnson said one time, we may not know everything, but we know the difference between chicken shit and chicken salad. Johnson wasn't always crude. He was just almost always crude. I spent a lot of my youth protesting Lyndon Johnson. He horrified in war. He was this big, complicated, inconsistent, bellowing, hypocritical, larger-than-life Texan. I grew up in Mesquite, Texas myself. Johnson would holler at you, wave his arms, spit on you, sweat on you. I don't know why I'm drawn to him. But he also taught that American poverty touches both our personal conscience and our national mission at the same time. Under circumstances not enough unlike our own, he said this, rarely in any time does an issue lay bare the secret heart of America itself. Rarely are we met with the challenge not to our growth or abundance or our security, but rather to the values and purposes and meaning of our beloved nation. And should we defeat every enemy, and should we double our wealth and conquer the stars and be unequal to this task, then we would have failed as a people and as a nation. For with a country, as with a person, what is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul, what is a man profit? So this is our challenge, the work, not to put too fine a point on it, but the work of our national soul, your work, what you do. We could wish it wasn't as lonely or as uphill or as controversial or as inadequately supported or as uncertain of success as it is. But sometimes when you think of great challenges, it's helpful to remember those who have gone before on this campus, in this state, in the South, in the United States. I'm pretty sure Fannie Lou Hamer didn't do an opinion poll before she started the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Mrs. Parks didn't conduct a focus group before she sat down for freedom. Cesar Chavez didn't ask if it would be easy or lauded or praised from every corner before he launched his famed hunger strike, saying instead, si, si se puede. This is not the first time people of great heart have been called upon to fight for justice against the odds. It is our heritage. It is our naming purpose. So it's an honor to be with you, to see you commit yourself to this life, subscribe to it declare it, to enroll your hearts. You enlist because I think, somewhere we read, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal. And we thought maybe we meant it. Stunning. Somewhere we read of one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, and justice for all. Somewhere we read history will judge us on the extent to which we've used our gifts to lighten and enrich the lives of our fellows. Somewhere we read injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. 
Somewhere we read, think about this. Maybe we ought to believe the things we teach our children. Believe them just for a minute and try to bring them to pass. And somewhere we read, of course, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And a whole lot of people in this room read, whenever you did these things for the least of these, you did them for me. And that same group read, you reap what you sow. And somewhere we read that the pursuit of justice and the pursuit of happiness can be as one. They march not in opposite directions, but hand in hand. And somewhere we read, no, we are not satisfied with this. We're not going to remain content with this. We are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied till justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you very much uh, for letting me join you. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very kind, but please don't, don't do that. You do real work. I'm a talker. So, I, are we going to do questions? Yeah. Yeah. Because, because we're recording this, you need to speak into the mic when you ask your questions. You don't have to, you know, I'm, we're getting in the way of the chow line, so. Thank you. Wow, this is really loud. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what's changed since the center has moved out of the institution and, and what that process was like some and, and what it's like now, what you hope to do next? Well, uh, I mean, the good news is as far as the work of the center goes, it's exactly the same. Um, uh, we have the same employees. We use the same funding sources. We have more money than we did because I, we, don't, we don't really ask people for money, but uh, I think when we're going through all this, uh, turmoil, uh, a lot of people sent us money and said, we don't believe in this kind of stuff. We don't think that's North Carolina. So uh, I guess it was not last July 1st, but the July 1st before that, uh, they closed the Poverty Center. That same day, we opened the North Carolina Poverty Research Fund. The people who've been working for the Poverty Center switched over and worked for the research fund. Uh, they still do. We're doing the same work. Um, it, there's an irony a little bit. The one thing that's harder for us to do is direct service work because it's a research fund instead of a center. So uh, now we were, I say it's ironic because we were closed down because they didn't like what we wrote and what we published. And so now we are more exclusively a writing and publishing outfit. But such is uh, life. Uh, we concentrate a great deal on the challenges of uh, poverty and economic justice in North Carolina. We, uh, I, I commend this to, we just released a, a report, uh, it almost looks prescient now, it was not, it wasn't meant to be. But we, we released a, a report on um, the challenges of concentrated, racialized, uh, economic uh, hardship in uh, Charlotte uh, about, a month ago, just a few weeks before the um, traumas of recent uh, days. It's indicative of the work we're doing, and uh, uh, it's on the website. I'd encourage you. This is what, what is a little different about it. We, it's, it's data-driven, like uh, you know, the work of a poverty center would be. But what we've learned, what I've learned uh, in the last 10 years, that uh, I'm very powerfully committed to is the data alone doesn't do it. Um, if you can, so a lot of this report is narrative. We spent 18 months interviewing low income folks in Charlotte who live right at the edge of homelessness and uh, destitution. It was uh, among the most life changing experiences I've ever had. These, uh, 
These were all, uh, they were all women, this group, uh, about 18 folks, they were all women of color, almost the vast majority were African-American, some Latino. Uh, they worked long hours. Uh, they faced incredible hardship. Uh, hardship that I'm, I'm just not sure I could bear. They did it with remarkable resilience and strength. Um, so uh, we have uh, stayed working together. We're going to keep working together. I'm going to, I enjoy a great deal just going, going down there and learning from these uh, folks. But much of this report we're talking about is narrative based on conversations with folks living in uh, uh, economic uh, hardship in uh, Charlotte. And it gives you a much different sense than the data does. Uh, we have just finished the same thing. We're about to release it. We have been working on Medicaid uh, expansion, um, uh, and we're going to release a report next week on it. it. It's a similar methodology in that it talks about the economics of Medicaid expansion like other reports do. There's been very powerful work done on that in North Carolina already. Um, but uh, a bunch of doctors came to us a year ago and said, you know what I wish you would do? is there's not enough discussion about what this means in the lives of my patients. Uh, I have patients who died as a result of this decision. So I don't, he said, I'm not sure people are getting that across. Uh, uh, and uh, the way I thought about it initially was, well, people need these serious procedures and the like, and uh, uh, they're not able to get them. Uh, and, and that's true as a result of the Medicaid decision. But um, uh, that's, for these doctors, that's not the larger part. The larger part is people who have high blood pressure and for not much money, they could get that under control, but they ain't got any money and they're, they're kicked off of Medicaid and therefore they're gonna die or they're gonna have a stroke and go in the emergency room and for the want of spending $75, we're gonna spend $300,000 or the same thing they would say about screenings for uh, diabetes, for mammograms, for colonoscopies and the like. Uh, so this report we're about to release is going to be based on the testimony or the narrative of folks, patients who can't get health care uh, or patients who get it and can't have specialists uh, and the like. And maybe most powerfully from doctors who work in low income communities because they see it systemically. Uh, and they make decisions that I didn't realize, I mean, it's stupid, but I didn't realize doctors were making. Um, and that they are, uh, these are immensely committed folks to serving low-income communities, but you have to make choices, which, and if you guess wrong, it might mean that your patient dies. Uh, so uh, we're, we're going to release that pretty soon. We've, we've done a report that we, uh, we haven't published yet, but that we're about to. We just want to let we're spreading them out a little on Goldsboro, uh, which is uh, a fascinating and challenging and uh, powerfully uh, uh, demanding place. Um, it's going to turn largely on narrative as well. And we are, uh, we have been spending a lot of time in the last month in Wilkes County. Is any of you know Wilkes County? Uh, sort of more the Appalachian side. Very intense poverty, had the, uh, one of the country's largest uh, decreases in median income of any county in the United States, one of the largest addiction rates, uh, too. Um, so a whole kind of set, different set of uh, uh, multi-generational poverty challenges. Uh, there is great work to do in North Carolina. We changed the focus of the Poverty Center. 10 years ago or something, to just to look with a laser at North Carolina and not, otherwise I did that under the belief that, man, we got plenty to look at here. And that, that turned out to be true. We got plenty to look at here. Thank you so much for um, coming here and reminding us all of the importance of our work um, in the babies. I love hearing that. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask about, uh, I guess, obvious thing, um, the current political climate, uh, not only within our state, but nationally. Um, it's been very ugly, and I think it's leading to um, a lot of political apathy 
Um, people just don't want to vote for either candidate or anyone. And so they're kind of withdrawing themselves from even learning what these individuals are standing for. I want to know, do you see any kind of uh, prospects for addressing the grand challenge of poverty among plenty, not only within North Carolina, but within our country? Well, uh, yeah, there you go. Um, let me say this about North Carolina first. All right? uh, I spent a lot of time trying to document and explain and advocate for and press against policies which hurt low-income people uh, and, and try to support policies which would help the plight of low-income people. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't have a great deal of success on this, that front. Um, I think it's, initially, you can see it from a partisan lens, and I, you, I eventually would agree with that, but when I, this, is, this needs to be said. Two thirds of the stuff I talked about today, if this was seven years ago, there would be a very similar set of results. Democrats have a long history in North Carolina of ignoring poor people. Yeah, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but that's the frank truth of it. Uh, we have learned in the last five years, there's one thing worse than ignoring poor people, and that's waging war on them. And that's what we've had. And there, there can be any doubt about this. I don't, uh, you know, I, people don't like it when it's said, but we have seen in the last five years uh, the nation's stoutest war on poor people, path-breaking. It's, it's frontier effort. Uh, and uh, it'll continue until it is forcibly rejected. People don't like it either when I say this. Um, we have experienced and continue to experience a war on black people in North Carolina. And think about it. Now, I can go through the list of legislation. Um, our president, uh, we have very large majorities, Republican majorities in both houses. They go into their caucuses and they decide to repeal the Racial Justice Act, to racially gerrymander these legislative districts, to racially gerrymander the federal districts, uh, to use surgical precision to discriminate against black people in a, a ID and other requirement, to decide we're gonna make it harder for uh, top cameras uh, to be released, we're gonna refuse to expand Medicaid, we're going to uh, enact the largest cut to an unemployment compensation program in American history, uh, we're going to end the earned income tax credit. All that happens and no black member in those caucuses rises to have his or her voice heard, even though North Carolina's maybe 23% African American. Uh, no one does that because there ain't any black member in those caucuses. So we have a war on poor people going on in North Carolina. We've got a war on gay people and uh, transgender folks. Uh, we've got a war on people of color. Uh, it's not nice to say it. Uh, it's not nice to say we have a white people's government right now in North Carolina. But we do. So I, I mean, I would just argue it's not nice to have one. It's not nice to approach things that way and to do it under this theory we got to be quick because you're not going to be able to govern north carolina in 10 years as a white people's government so you better get while the getting's good and you better make it hard for people to vote uh, that's what we face now so uh, to me uh all i would say is i don't know how there could be more at stake than that so if it's if there was ever a time for all hands on deck whatever your vision of on deck means and whatever deck you choose to occupy. This is it. There's no use holding your powder for some other more cataclysmic event. Uh, it's not, we have, a, we have a fight in North Carolina for our own decency. Now, to annoy the Democrats, let me say this, you wouldn't know it from the Democrats running for office. That 
they don't seem to know we're in a fight for our decency. You know, uh, now I'm old friends with Roy Cooper. Uh, he seems to think we ought to vote for him because his mama was a school teacher. Uh, I'm old friends with Deborah Ross. She's talking about, uh, I don't know what, uh, Richard Burr's uh, getting money from the insurance companies, like every other person in uh, Washington. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to badmouth those. What I'm saying is that doesn't show recognition that we're in a fight for our very existence here. Now, I think there's a disconnect between our political campaigns and uh, what's at stake in North Carolina. For me, as one who's active a lot, there's a disconnect between the activism of North Carolina and the partisan politics of North Carolina. Uh, so it's a real challenge. And then, you know, I don't know what you want me to say about this presidential race. I spoke last night to a large and wonderful group in Raleigh was made up mostly of people of faith uh, who had gotten together in churches and locked arms with Muslims, the Muslim community from across Raleigh, and they were working hard together to push back against these hateful messages and to try and develop a community against powerful odds. Uh, it is inspiring as hell. I mean, it's, it's just hard to describe how ennobling that is. On the other hand, why we should have to be fighting that fight uh, at this time in our history, or why black people should be trying to be able to get electoral participation at this time in our history. Get, one thing is th these folks hadn't studied our history, I know. If, if you just knew the blood, the tears, the sweat, the death, the danger, you would never want to reopen the civil rights movement uh, and the civil war. But uh, that's what we're relitigating in North Carolina. So if that ain't enough to get you interested, I don't know what to say to you. Yes. I'm oh. <laughs> it's Amy's one of my heroes, so she can't really ask me a mean question, I wouldn't think, <laughs> but she will. So. Now, um, I, one wonderful thing about listening to you always is that you speak to the spirit, I think, in a way that few people do. And you have been involved in faith communities in your work. And I always find myself wondering, you know, when you think about the people in their caucuses, and I, I never know how, and I won't speak about people in their caucuses necessarily, but how folks can sort of reconcile their faith traditions with some of the positions that they are taking and espousing. And so I wonder, and then also thinking about many changes in this country coming because, in at least in large part, because of the actions of communities of faith. And so what are you seeing now when you are out in in, in those communities? I mean, are there, is there hope that people will speak from the pulpit to their congregations to say? Yes, there, there is. is I, I mean, let, me, let me separate kind of electoral stuff from community stuff first, uh, because the, the, what, what you ask is really powerful on both fronts. Um, I uh, spend a lot of time in uh, low income communities in North Carolina. I am, have been shocked literally shocked, I shouldn't have been, at the selflessness which frequently occurs in those communities uh, on behalf of other North Carolinians. And it is very often religiously based. Uh, this, uh, it's one of the most um, powerful of the experiences that you would have. Uh, and you know, I was, a, uh, I was a university administrator for a while. I, I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, but I've, that, being a university administrator meant I've been around rich people, some. And you know, there's one sense where you think, well, rich people are generous and you, you hope they're increasingly generous to kind of uh, help. But what I hadn't thought about so much, that, man, the people who are generous are poor folk who don't have two dimes to rub together 
And what they will do in communities across North Carolina for people that they think are even worse off, I just, I can hardly grasp it. It makes you feel like a shit is what it makes me feel like. I live here in Chapel Hill. Uh, but the way I put it is Mother Teresa would not be lonely in North Carolina. But here's what I'd say to that too. That's, that's some of the community. Uh, I work a lot with the uh, uh, Open Door Baptist Church in Conover, North Carolina, that serves the homeless folk in Hickory, just next door. And they, you know, when I first met them, they had a budget of $7,000 a year, and they spent all their efforts trying to keep people from dying in the woods in Hickory. Unbelievable what they did. Tiny little church. Uh, now, I grew up Catholic, and I, uh, with Francis around, you can sort of say that a little better than you used to. Um, uh, so, and these, these folk, I, what, what, when we talk, I say, well, uh, I love working with you guys maybe six and a half days a week. I don't know what I would think if I was there on Sunday morning, to be honest, all right? Uh, different religious uh, connotation. Unbelievable stuff, selflessness. Unbelievable. And courage. It's scary to work in, in those communities. Now, every one of these folks who has changed my life would say this. I, I think this is an accurate description of the poverty challenge in North Carolina on this front. I'd say first, hardship is immensely more pronounced than people understand. Poverty is just a lot worse than most all of us know. Second, there are people in every community in North Carolina who are doing selfless endeavor that you can scarcely believe. It is so selfless, and so driven by the human heart. Third, every one of those people would say, it is nowhere near enough to make up the gulf between what is needed and what we can provide. Uh, if they were inclined, they would say with Augustine that charity cannot make up for a want of justice, and we have a powerful want of justice. And then fourth, every one of them would say, we're losing ground. So that, that would be the portrait of uh, the religious endeavor. And just to sort of make the other side uh, on the religious claim, uh, those folks working in the woods, they're out of the Open Door Baptist Church have tried to go to some of the big churches in Hickory where people are living just kind of at the edge of their buildings. And uh, they have said, you are sending your sons and daughters to Haiti on these medical missions we got people living in the woods 1,400 yards from your church. Will you help us and have them come do the medical mission here? Well, no, they won't. And I understand that. It's much tougher uh, at home. Then they said, a little worse, how about if you gave us 10% of your landscaping budget? I must admit, I kind of thought that was a pretty good request. Uh, they wouldn't do that either. So it's a mixed bag with regard to religion, just like religion is a mixed bag when it comes to politics. Uh, there, I don't know what's gonna happen after this presidential election. Seems to me there's some chance that a broad cut of people would say, man, we got politics which doesn't represent ascertainable set of values on either side or in either camp. But let's uh, let's remake ourselves. Uh, I'm, I'm very heavily involved in the Moral Monday movement. I'm a big and uh, uh, immensely loyal fan of Reverend Barber. He has done much to both kind of bring progressive uh, thought sort of in the from, from the religious side, religious uh, progressive uh, uh, moral mandate. Um, and he's done a lot, uh, which is tough, because I've done some of this and it's kind of hard, to, to bridge communities, um, uh, which is not always easy. Uh, in, in North Carolina, for example, uh, having uh, some religious communities work hand in hand against Amendment 1 or against HB 2 has been complicated. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's good at that, and he's got some scars on his back to uh, demonstrate it. Um, 
uh, I've even uh, done a little of it myself, and it is it can be funny at least. Uh, let me just leave it at that. All right. Anyway, thanks very much. It's an honor to be with you, as I said. Thank Good you. luck to you.